come here. You can. I should. Stand in the here. dock. Stand in the dock? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we can try you. <laughs> 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 Okay, um, thank you everybody for uh, hanging on in there. Um, it's great to be here. Um, and this is also our first law outing. Um, I am a senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Roehampton, and Rich is a postdoc in philosophy at the London School of Economics. And today we are going to be talking to you about pet power and legitimacy. And just as a kind of nice follow up to <laughs> that last point on Dawn's paper, Actually, one of the things that we're really concerned with is this scaling up issue, um, and that's really what's motivating us on the back of our work on animal agency. Okay, um, so there are lots of pets in the world, um, millions and millions and millions of pets. Um, it's um, estimated that over half of the world's population live with pets. In the UK, there are 12 million, just under 12 million cats, just under 12 million dogs, a million rabbits, um, and there are only 14 million children under the age of 18. And that pattern is, is quite common, right? That there are many more pets in the world or in countries than there are children. So one thing I just want to sort of flag before we get going is that this isn't a fringe issue, right? Like, there are lots of pets, um, and our practices of pet keeping matter. So... Um, in terms of the kind of philosophical literature um, on pet keeping, lots of people have focused on the well-being of individual animals, right? So everybody sort of broadly agrees our pet keeping practices are not all great, right? There's lots of neglect, abuse, people don't really know what they're doing with their pets, they're too busy um, to care for their pets. There are problems to do with uh, breeding practices, um, health disorders that are associated with pedigree, um, breeds. So all of those things are kind of well documented and philosophers largely accept that like yes the current state of affairs is pretty bad. But there are many philosophers who also think we can make this right. Okay, So we can make this right and there is a possibility of a just interspecies world in which we live with companion animals. So uh, examples here are people like Alistair Cochrane, uh, Claire Palmer and TJ Casper Bauer. Um, Christine Korsgaard, Martha Nussbaum, arguably um, C. Donaldson and Will Kimlick, although they're slightly complicated, but there is some world, right, in which we can live with animals as uh, companions. Now, we think that the kind of current debate is problematic because it fixates on discrete interactions between pets and their guardians and the well-being of individual animals and there's not enough attention on the power relations that constitute the institution of pet keeping. Um, so here we're going to sort of loosely understand that in, uh, the institution of pet keeping is a socio-political institution that instantiates systematic relations of power between millions of humans and non-human animals through a public system of legal and social norms. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a second. But the most important thing is that we're shifting away from thinking about harms done to individual animals by their guardians to thinking about the institution of pet keeping and the relations of power that constitute it. Okay, um, so once we move to thinking about power, kind of standard for in uh, liberal political philosophy is that no one has natural legitimate authority over another. So insofar as I want to coerce or compel Rich to do what I want him to, right, he has a complaint against me unless I can justify that attempt to coerce or compel him. So it's a standard idea um, in, in, in the liberal tradition of political philosophy, and we think that that applies in the context of pets. So the central questions for us are, what gives the state the right to issue and enforce laws that govern the lives of pets? And what gives individual guardians the authority to control, coerce, and demand obedience from these animals? Right? So these are the central questions guiding our inquiry. And our answer is there are no satisfactory answers to these questions. And more specifically, what we want to argue is that pets have three unanswerable complaints against the relation of power that is imposed upon them. And that makes those relationships illegitimate. Okay? 
there's no way of justifying these relations of power to pets, and so they are illegitimate. A practical implication of this, which we are not going to be able to defend, is that this gives us a strong moral reason to dismantle the institution of pet keeping, right? So if we're right about this, and that these relationships of power are illegitimate, there's no way of justifying them, then really we ought to find ways to dismantle the institution of pet keeping, enter those who are interested in laws and <laughs> policy <laughs> reform, okay. Right, so I'm gonna say a little bit about pets and power before handing over to Rich, who's gonna do some of the complaints or, yeah, okay. Right, okay, so pets and power. So I think that most commonly we're familiar with the power that we exercise over pets in the domestic sphere. Um, so we coerce our pets in various ways. It might be we decide where they can sleep, um, what they eat, when they eat, uh, what they drink, when they drink, um, whether they have access to other animals, whether they have social opportunities, opportunities for play, whether they can go inside, uh, where they can defecate and urinate, whether they can reproduce, whether they raise their young, whether they have access to veterinary care, and ultimately we decide whether they live or die, right? So we have all of this power over animals in the domestic context, um, and so they are subject to this relation of power. But it's not just uh, domestic power that pets are subject to, they're also subject to centralized political power. So the power that guardians and breeders um, have over the animals in their care comes through or is assigned by the state and it's regulated by political decision making and the rule of law. So in the context of the UK, there's all bit, loads of bits of legislation which are governing who can have a pet, um, the conditions under which pets can be sold, um, where pets can go, the conditions under which they can be, or the, the requirements on guardians for their treatment, um, public protection orders, you know, can you take your dog to a park or farmland, right? There are all kinds of bits of legislation that are determining the rights and responsibilities of those who decide to have pets. So pets are subject to power directly from their guardians, but also at the level of the state. Okay, now on one kind of, one attempt to legitimate power, you might say, well, you know, power is justified um, when those who are subject to it can kind of voluntarily consent to it. It's just not possible in the case of pets, right? There are very few pets who uh, voluntarily sign up to be so socially positioned, right, as subordinate to a guardian. And for most pets, there is no meaningful opportunity of exit from their social position as a pet. And then lastly, just a kind of observation about the institution of pet keeping. This is deeply entrenched social structure. People do not stop to think about it as an institution or, or uh, a social structure that we are deliberately maintaining and reproducing. We often think about it as an individual choice, right? Can I, you know, do I want a pet, right? I desire to have a dog, I'll go and get one, right? That's how we think about it. We don't think about it as a kind of pa uh, 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 unorganized in institution which is structured by the state. Moreover, it's generally assumed that adults just have right, a right to acquire a pet for whatever reason um, and that we have um, the right to possess and exercise the power that we do over these animals. Right? So this is the kind of the background. So given all of this, right, this raises this question about legitimacy. Do we have such a right? Are we justified in exercising power over animals uh, in these ways? Over to you. Here comes the dog. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so uh, I didn't know if I was going to kind of give a defence, so uh, but then it, it didn't really make sense. But anyway, okay, good. So, so as Angie said, we think that just in the way that power exercised over us needs to be justified, power exercised over all animals needs to be justified, especially when those relations of power are socially organised and scaffolded in the kinds of way that Angie suggested. 
And while we don't have a complete view of legitimacy, we're working with this idea that legitimate power relations are those in which the subject of power doesn't have complaints against the imposition or maintenance of those relations of power by the ruler, right? Um, and we, in fact, think, as Andy said, that pets have three important complaints um, which, taken together, I think we think make a strong case to show that the power we exercise over pets is not, in fact, legitimate. I'm going to go through, I think, the first two. So the first complaint concerns not the effects that our possession or exercise of power has on animals kept as pets or companions, but the way in which that power is justified. So we think that in order to be morally acceptable, relations of, or justifications for power, proffered justifications of power, must respect what we're calling the moral independence of non-human animals. It must also respect the moral independence of human animals, and I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. And I should also just say we're stealing this idea of moral independence and its relevance for power from Daniel Vihoff. So it's not, this, is, this isn't especially original to us, but we think it's useful in getting to one of the major problems here. So when I say it must respect the moral independence of non-human animals, what do I mean? Well, very roughly, the thought behind moral independence is something like we're familiar with the fact that we are each individuals with our own life to lead, who are embodied, who have our own outlook on the world, have our own relationships with others, our own projects, our own interests, and so on and so forth. And that, generally speaking, this individuality or separateness of individuals is taken to be morally quite significant. And it's often used or appealed to to motivate various moral constraints on how we can interact with one another. So, for example, whilst if I were to decide to make, uh, take up the hobby of making soap, and I could test my homemade soap on my own skin to see whether there are any allergic reactions. I couldn't test my soap on your skin without your consent, right? Or well, much more generally, I can't use you for my own projects and purposes unless you give me permission to do so. Now, this sort of general observation about, say, an aspect of our moral status also has implications for the way in which uh, we can justify having and exercising power over one another. So that's, I think, just the last point that I was... Yeah. So how does it do so? Well, there's a kind of normative asymmetry between you and me in this respect. So, for example, it would probably be useful if I had power over you, because if I had power over you, you could chop wood for my fire, go to the shops to get my provisions, redecorate my house, and so on and so forth. My having power over you would serve my interest in all of these really useful ways. But we don't think my attempt to justify having power over you in this way would succeed, because it wouldn't respect the fact that you are your own person with your own projects, relationships, and interests, and your own life to lead, right? So the thought here is, it's not just that my interest in having power over you aren't sufficient or are outweighed by your interests. It's that appealing to my interests of this kind and having power over you are of the wrong kind for me to justify having power over you in this way. It would fail to respect your moral independence to try and justify power in this way. And so we can, uh, we are sort of articulate this general thought as the subject focus constraint on power. And I think indeed it's an idea that you find in, in different guises, but very familiarly in liberal political philosophy quite generally. So the idea is that in order to be Good justifications, justifications of power must be made by appeal to the interests or reasons of the subjects of power themselves. The interests or projects of the would-be ruler that would be served by the possession of power cannot enter the justification. So my interests that would be served by having power over you, because I could get you to chop my wood and go to the shops and redecorate my house, those interests or reasons can't enter the justification. It's only because Say, if I had power over you, I could help you um, fulfill some important interest or reason of your own. That's very roughly the thought. And the thought is this has quite significant implications for our ability to justify having power over pets. Why? Well, because most both implicit and explicit justifications for our both having and maintaining significant relations of power over those animals kept as pets or companions appeal to human interests, motivations, desires, projects, and so forth. And you hear all different kinds of these, but um, you know, 
Companionship is, of course, a common one. We, we desire companionship with others, including other non-human animals. Often they're also used in sort of educative roles for, with regard to children, teaching them about death or caring responsibilities and so forth. And the basic idea is that none of these justifications even get off the ground. It's not they contribute a little bit and they're outweighed. Again, they just don't get off the ground because they appeal to our interests, not the interests of the non-human animals that we have power over. Now, you might be thinking, well, what about all of the non-human animals and pet and de pets who exist now, over whom... Oh, <laughs> you might be thinking, we, <laughs> we have five minutes left. <laughs> you, so, uh, I can, I'll tell you what, actually, I think for the purposes of brevity... No, 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 no. Okay, go. Right. So, you might be thinking... So, you might be thinking, well, well like, what about all the pets that already exist? Surely we have to exercise power over them in order to serve their interests. They're dependent on us, and if we were to just not stand back and not do anything, they'd all have horrible lives and die. Okay, fine. We accept and think it's important that that kind of reasoning provides local justifications for us to exercise power over pen animals that exist now, although I think it's important that it might not justify doing the kind of things that we think it justifies doing, but nevertheless, it might justify particular uses of power, but it can't be appealed to as a general justification for maintaining the practice. Why? Because if you deliberately create a problem and then say, oh, the only way of my solving the problem is by exercising power, that violates the moral independence, the, the respect for moral independence condition very roughly. It's actually quite similar to, and it was an interesting parallel, the last part of the necessity defense, right? I can't create an emergency and then say, oh, as of necessity, I must break into this property in order to write. If you create the emergency, you won't have a defense. And the basic thought is, we create the emergency in which our power provides the only solution um, to serving the interests of these animals. So whilst it might be important in the short term, it can't provide a general legitimation for the practice. Very briefly, I'll say something about the second complaint, and then very briefly, Andrew, should I say something about the third complaint? The second complaint, I mean, and for those of you familiar with our old paper, maybe we'll have an, an into this already. Um, but so the first complaint was about the way in which relations of power are justified. This second complaint is a particular interest or set of interests that we think our practices of pet keeping uh, significantly thwart. And that is the interest in self-determination of those kept as pets. Or put differently, interest in having control over one's body, experience, and environment. Right? Now, it's controversial the extent to which non-human animals and non-human animals different kind have these interests. Suffice it to say for now, we think they do have these interests to at least a very significant degree. Um, and so insofar as practices of companionship and pet keeping, and even really I think we think the sort of kind of the desirable or ideal types, they all involve significantly thwarting the interests of animals in, in being self-determining, in having control over their own bodies, environment, and actions. And that, we think, grounds a significant complaint on their behalf. Back in the dock. Okay. So the very last complaint that animals have um, is really a complaint against being exposed to risk of harm, right? So, and it's not about them actually being harmed, but this is just about risk. So we're borrowing here a little bit from Goodin, um, who argued that it's morally objectionable, and this just seems kind of straightforward, to unnecessarily subject individuals to the serious risks of harm that are associated with relationships of asymmetrical power, dependency, and vulnerability. And we've seen, right, that pets are subordinate to their human guardians. They stand in these relationships of vulnerability um, to their guardians. They're dependent upon their guardians to meet their basic needs. They're vulnerable to the whims of their guardians, guardians and the competencies of their guardians. So they are incredibly vulnerable. But importantly, um, they're vulnerable because we have decided to make them so. Right? This is not accidental. Um, and so one thing that's important here is that it's not an objection to relationships of dependency and vulnerability per se. Right? That is a fact of sentient animal life, that we are vulnerable and dependent. But what it is an objection to is vulnerability that is created and exacerbated by us. Right? We have a choice about what we're doing. We have a choice about how we organize our social and political world. And so, insofar as we have this institution that we continue to maintain, which socially positions animals as vulnerable to, uh, vulnerable to risk and risk of harm and dependent upon others, that gives us or gives them a strong complaint against being so positioned, right? We make them vulnerable and they have a complaint against being made vulnerable in those ways. 
Okay, so conclusion, look, look at that timing. <laughs> okay, um, so in conclusion, we think that the institution of pet keeping involves an exercise of power over sentient animals that stands in need of justification. So we should stop just thinking about uh, ethical evaluations of pet keeping in terms of the actual harm that's being done to individual animals and take a step back and look at the practice as a whole and think about those relationships of power that uh, constitute that institution and we have to think about what justifies it, right? What justifies us continually bringing animals into existence so that they can be socially positioned as pets? You didn't like that? Okay. <laughs> you don't, uh, don't, no. Wait, well, anyway, you can have your say in a second. Um, so we think that this power can't be justified because animals have these three complaints, right? And it's very difficult to see how you're going to come up with a justification that appeals to their interests, right? That isn't that also can outweigh this concern about them being exposed to uh, risk of harm and also having their interests in self-determination thwarted. And given that, we think that this gives us a strong moral reason to dismantle the institution of pet keeping. Was there something that you wanted to add there? Not I will that. allow you to speak no, if, you, if you want. No, okay, in which case, thank you um, very much.